I defer this morning our studies on the book of Philippians because I want to address this morning matters that are in the thoughts of most of us today because of the super storm. Hayan or Yolanda. It is innate in human nature, in human beings, to try to make sense and meaning of what is happening. But facts, events, and experiences are not self-interpreting. For them to have any meaning to us personally, then we must interpret those facts, events, and experiences. But how are we to interpret them? How are we to make sense and meaning of what has been happening? Well, it is here that we need God's revelatory words, the scriptures. Without the help of God's revelatory word preserved to us in the scriptures, we will not be able to interpret these events accurately and we cannot really appropriately respond to them. In Psalm 36 verse 9, David says, For with you, with God, is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. It is only in God's light that we have light. Apart from the light that is from God, we will be in darkness. We will not be able to interpret facts, events, and experiences accurately. Also, you remember the words in Psalm 119, verse 105. The psalmist writes, your word, God's word, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Without the light that comes from God's word, we will be in darkness. We will not be able to make sense of the facts, of the events, and the experiences. We will not be able to interpret them accurately. We will not even know over what we stumble. For in the words of Jesus in Matthew 22 and verse 29, he said to the Sadducees, you are mistaken, not understanding the scriptures, nor the power of God. We need to understand God's written word and the eternal power of God in order to avoid error in the way we interpret facts, events, and experiences. Unless we know his word and the eternal and originated power of God, we are bound to be mistaken. We do not have sufficient resources in ourselves to try to interpret those events experiences on our own. We need the light that comes from God. In His light, we see light. We need His light in order to have light. Now, face with the recent devastating calamities, how are we to interpret them? How are we to understand them? Well, first, I want us to consider the errors to avoid. And then we're going to look at the truths to believe. So first, the errors to avoid. And there are two errors that we have to avoid. In interpreting these events, these calamities, there are two errors that we are particularly to avoid. First, we must avoid interpreting calamitous events as though they are only due to natural or human causes and not ultimately to God's will. There are natural causes. That is not to be denied. 
and that there are human causes that led to this calamity like the climate change that is possible if not probable. But the error that must be avoided is to view these calamities as if they are only due to natural or human causes. Because everything that comes to pass is ulti ultimately because God will be glad. There are natural causes. There could be human causes. But let us not forget that ultimately God will be to happen. The scripture is clear on that. Isaiah 45 verses 7 to 5. Here God in the midst of the pagan ideas of who God is. God declares him to be someone who is entirely unique. And he says in Isaiah 45 verse 5, God says, I am the Lord and there is no other besides me. There is no God. I will gird you, Cyprus, though you have not known me. That man may know from the rising to the setting of the sun that there is no one besides. I am the Lord and there is no other. The one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all. Nothing happens on earth or in the universe apart from God. He is in control of everything. Good and evil described figuratively as light and darkness, well-being and calamities or peace and chaos are not only are not two eternally coexistent independent powers battling against one another. God is the ultimate cause of both. And he is in control of both. And both serve the wise and the good purpose of the one and only God. It serves his purpose. Both are instruments of his perfect and wise and holy will. And that is what makes the true and the living God utterly unique and different from the pagan conceptions of their gods created by their human imagination and because of truth suppression. If God, if, and if God owns it both, that he is ultimately in control of everything. So must we. The one creating darkness and light. Causing well-being. And calamity. And that is what God makes God entirely unique. If you study the pagan concepts of God, they have a hierarchy of gods. Or the forces of good and evil are viewed as eternally coexistent, battling against one another. But God says, no, I am in control of everything. And that, what, what, that is what makes him entirely unique. And look at Lamentations 3. Lamentations 3 and verse 37. God says, Who is there who speaks and it comes to pass? Who is there who speaks and it comes to pass. Who 
37. Who is there who speaks and it comes to pass unless the Lord has commanded it? Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both good and ill go forth? Man's will is not the efficient cause of what will happen. Unless God wills it to happen, what man wills will never happen. In fact, God's will is the efficient cause of both good and ill, of both well-being and misfortune. And God says, and makes it very clear that his will is supreme over man. And then in Amos chapter 3 and verse 6, we have the same. And this is something that the Bible repeatedly emphasizes in the light of many perverse ideas of who God is. God declares himself clearly as utterly unique. In Amos 3 and verse 6, If a trumpet is blown in a city, will not the people tremble? If a calamity occurs in a city, has not the Lord done it? No calamity will ever fall a place unless the Lord has a hand on it. Although secondary causes are also involved in these calamities. And there might be human causes of these calamities. And yet God is the one who ultimately willed it to happen. God is over all and in all. Every disaster, every calamity come from God and serves his own holy and wise. And then in Job chapter 2. From the mouth of Job, when he experienced the calamities that fell upon him in one day, that were simply overwhelming. Job 2. And verse 9. And his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. Well, apparently she even knows that calamities come from God. He says, Why don't you curse this God? And die. Why do you still trust him and believe him? Do you still hold fast your integrity, curse God, and die? And he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin. Job and his wife understood that not only prosperity, but also adversity come from God. And while Job's wife resented it, Job humbly submitted to it. Therefore, avoid the error of interpreting calamitous events as though they are just due to natural and human causes. We must not minimize possible human causes, but neither are we to deny ultimately that God willed them to happen. Or they will never happen. That's the first error. But then second error to avoid in interpreting these natural calamities. We must avoid interpreting them as though they are necessary indications of God's judgment for specific sins of the people who suffered them. This is the error that the Lord Jesus warned some in Luke 13, verses 1 to 5.
The first mention had to do with a human cause. Notice in verse 1, Now on the same occasion there were some present who reported to him, to Jesus, about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered the state? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Verse 4, Or do you suppose that those 18 in whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the men who live in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Unexpected death due to human violence and tragic death due to quote and quote accidents does not indicate that those who suffer them are greater sinners than those who survive or are providentially spared from this day. All fallen humanity is not right before God. And all deserve His judgment. All therefore should repent and believe or else face the frightening judgment of God. So when disastrous and calamitous events fall upon some, we must not conclude that they must have been worse sinners than those who have been providentially spared that they have somehow been judged by God for specific sins that they have committed. And that's why they were judged in such way, because they were worse culprits than those who were spared. Jesus says, no. Those who suffer in these catastrophes are not worse sinners than other men who have been providentially spared. In fact, even the saved or the righteous might have his life cut short prematurely because of these calamities, while a wicked man may live a very long life. Isn't that what Solomon said in his observation in Ecclesiastes? 7 verse 15, he said, I have seen everything during my lifetime of futility, that there is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his wickedness. Well, some believers have been affected by the storm. There are many who rebel against God who have been spared. Therefore, never conclude that calamitous events that fall on people are necessary indication of God's judgments for specific sin that those who suffered committed or that they were worse sinners than those who have been providentially spared. We are not in a position to make any judgment concerning that issue to make a specific or a sweeping judgment would be to go beyond our human limitation. It is to arrogate to ourselves a work of which we are not competent to do. Therefore, avoid that error. Never make the mistake. Of making such a pronouncement. Or in your speech, you make them appear that those who died and suffered are somehow worse sinners than those who were spared. That is not true. All deserve God's judgment. But He will have mercy on whom He will have mercy. He will have compassion. It is for God to decide. And it's not on the basis of often what he has done. We're sinners or not. 
and we are not in a position to arrogate ourselves the work of which we are not competent to do. Jesus made it clear. Never draw that conclusion. So avoid that error. So how then are we to interpret natural disasters and calamities, catastrophes? Well, having considered the errors to avoid, let us consider secondly the truths to believe. The truths to believe. And there are several. First, all disasters and calamities are the result of the alienation of man and the earth. As an act of judgment from God for man's rebellion and alienation from God. Simply put, sin. Sin has alienated man from God and as a result, God alienated the earth and man. The scripture is clear that man and the earth are intimately related and connected. Earth is our home. Note the setting of man's creation in Genesis chapter 2. Here you have to think with me. Don't relax your thoughts and wander away. Follow me carefully. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 5, we read, Now no shrub of the field was yet in the earth, and no plant on the, of the field had yet sprouted. For the Lord God has not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no man to cultivate the ground. But a mist used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God for man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Now it's clear from the structure, particularly in the Hebrew, that the setting of the creation of man was the need for the earth for someone to cultivate it. There was no man to cultivate. Then God formed man from dust of the ground. And it was man whom God created in order to cultivate the earth, to rule over the earth. The setting of the creation of the woman was man's need for someone to help him. That's clear in Genesis 2, verse 18. And here again, the structure is very clear. After God created the first man, he was alone. And so we read in verse 18, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called the living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle, to the birds, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. And so what did God do? Verse 21, so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon man. And he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in that place. And the Lord fashioned into a woman the rib that was taken from man. So you see, the setting of the woman's creation was the need for man to have a helper suitable for him. Of all the animals, there was no suitable helper. So God created a woman for the man. But so also was the creation of man. The setting was there was no man to cultivate the earth. So God formed man from dust to take care of the earth, to cultivate. The ground. Therefore, there is an intimate connection between man and the earth. The two are intimately related and connected. 
Moreover, God created man to rule the earth as his representative. That's made clear in Genesis 1.26. If you turn there for a moment. In Genesis 1.26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the ground. God made man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and rule. As the image and likeness of God, man, both male and female, were to rule over all the creatures on the earth and over the whole earth. Man is to subdue the earth, that is to harness its resources for man's good and for God's glory. That was his rule. And his position in God's creation. But the rebellion and alienation of man from God resulted in God's judgment that led to the alienation of man. And the earth. When man rebelled against God, it did not only alienate God and man, destroy their relationship, but in judgment against man's rebellion against God, God also alienated the earth from man. We see this in Genesis 3, verse 17. Man was made from the dust of the ground. In verse 17, and when God comes in judgment because of human rebellion, then to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it. Curse is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles, it will grow, it shall grow for you. And you will eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face or brows. You will eat bread till you return to the ground. Because from it you were taken. For you are dust. And to dust you shall return. God cursed the ground because of man. And it results in the alienation of the earth and man. Weeds will grow more easily and rapidly than fruit bearing trees and plants. Man will have to labor hard by the sweat of his brows in order to make the earth fruitful until man will return to the dust from which he was taken. To borrow the words of another, whereas formerly man was to rule the earth, now the ground swallows him, draining his effort, energy, and life, and eventually enveloping his body, and it returns to the earth. The earth, in that sense, conquers man. He returns to the earth. This is man's alienation from the ground from which he was taken. That's because of human sin, alienation, rebellion from God. Moreover, because of the increase of human rebellion against God on earth, God judged humanity universally by destroying it with the earth, the universal flood. If you turn to Genesis 6, the language of Scripture is careful to know that the very instrument that will destroy man universally was the earth. In Genesis 6 and verse 11, Now Noah became the father 
Verse 11. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God. And the earth was filled with violence. God looked on the earth and behold it was corrupt for all flesh. All human beings have corrupted their way upon the earth. Then God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. And then he specified Noah, but that for the survival of the human race. He was to make an ark. But you see, because of human rebellion and alienation from God, God was going to destroy man with the very earth from which man was created, from the earth. The very earth that man was to cultivate and rule. This shows the alienation of man from the earth because of man's rebellion and alienation from God. The very place of which is our home then becomes the instrument of human destruction. Now after the universal flood during the time of Noah, God promised that he will never again destroy all human beings on earth with the water of the flood. There will still be local and regional floods and catastrophes. No question about that. But he promised that while the earth remains, destruction with water will never reach global proportions. But the reason is not because human beings after the flood have become less sinful and rebellious against God. But it is purely as an act of God's common grace. We read this in Genesis chapter 8. In Genesis chapter 8. In verse 21. After the flood. We read in verse 21. The Lord smelled the soothing aroma. And the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man. That is, he will never again use the ground as an instrument of human destruction. In global proportion. For the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. And I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. And then in chapter 9, verse 8. Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, Now behold, I myself do establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you. Of all that comes out of the ark and every beast of the earth, I will establish my covenant with you. And all flesh shall never again be cut off from the water of the flood. Never again shall... Neither shall there again be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, This is the sign of the covenant which I am making between you and me, between me and you and every living creature that is with you. For all successive generations I will set my bow in the flood. It shall be a sign for a covenant between me and the earth. Now this is no promise that there will be no regional disasters or calamities. But God here in common grace promised that he will postpone universal destruction and judgment. He will restrain his holy wrath. Until the earth remains. There will be the regularity of the season. Day and night. Summer and winter. Until the earth 
remain. But all of this, what we must not forget is that all of these regional disasters and calamities are a result of the alienation of man and the earth. Which is also God's judgment because of man's alienation and rebellion against God. And again, we must guard against the error of thinking that those who suffer those calamities are worse sinners than other men who are providentially spared from it. Yes, but neither are we to fail to see that these catastrophes are ultimately the result of man's alienation from the earth because of man's alienation and rebellion against God. So that's the first thing we have to uphold. Why is earth not as safe a place for man to live? Because of man's alienation from God. The very earth which is his home can become the instrument of his death. So that's the first. The second truth we have to believe as we interpret these events is that all calamities and disasters are signs pointing to the universal and final judgment of all who refuse to repent and believe in the gospel and be reconciled to God. All Disasters and calamities are signs pointing to the universal and final judgment of all who refuse to repent and believe in the gospel and be reconciled to God. See, the Bible is clear that history is linear, not cyclical. There was a beginning creation and there will be an ultimate end. And what is, what will be that end? Second Peter chapter 3, verses 10 to 11. Second Peter 3. Just like there was a universal flood that destroyed the earth during the time of Noah. Beginning from verse 3, know this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the father fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. But when they maintain this, it escaped their notice, but the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. Verse 7, and by his word the present heavens and the earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. In verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. It will be unexpected in which the heavens will pass away with the roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burnt up. And so all these things are to be destroyed in this way. What sort of people are you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming day of God because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness The earth, as well as the entire universe, is reserved for judgment. It will be destroyed by fire, no longer with water. There will be a cosmic holocaust that will destroy everything. And the outcome of that destruction will be the re-emergence 
or the emergence of a recreated universe, the new heavens and the new earth for righteousness. But as the world moves closer to that end, there will be an increasing frequency and intensity of disasters and calamities. There will be indications that it's moving towards the end. And one of those indications is natural disasters and calamity. This is clear from the words of Jesus in Mark 13, verses 4 to 8. Mark 13. Tell us, the disciples asked the Lord Jesus, when will these things be? What will be the sign when all these things are going to be fulfilled? Jesus began to say to them, see to it that no one misleads you. Many will come in my name saying, I am, and will mislead many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be frightened. Those things must take place. But that is not yet the end. For nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will also be famines. These things are merely the beginning of the birth pan. Be on your guard. These are only the beginnings. Several indications here are mentioned about the signs of the end that points to the end. And these signs are graphically described as the beginning of the birth times. They are not yet the end. But they indicate that the end is coming. When a woman who is pregnant begins to feel those birth pains, those contractions, she knows that soon she will be birth. And there will be the increase of the frequency of those and the intensity of the pain before the final cons contraction that leads to the birth of the child. These birth pangs are described more comprehensively for us in Luke 21. In Luke 21, and verse 25, there will be signs in the sun and moon and stars, and on the earth dismay among nations in perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting from fear and the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Men fainting from fear and the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world, this birth pangs includes catastrophes, earthquakes, tsunamis, superstorms in increasing frequency and intensity. In recent years, the earth has, has seen unprecedented earthquakes. Tsunamis, superstorms, and storm surges. And what, whether the secondary causes of these unprecedented causes can be attributed to global warming or not, and therefore has a human cause. The thing important to remember is that they have been prophesied. And we must view them as birth pangs. 
eschatological contraction as preliminary events pointing us to the coming final judgment. Moreover, we have to understand that these catastrophes and calamities will not only increase in terms of frequency, like birth times, but they will also increase in intensity. The most powerful storm on human record. And President and there is increased frequency of flooding, storms, with increasing devastating power. They will not get better. It will only get worse. And that is something we have to understand. The more a pregnant woman experiences those pains, the more painful those pains she knows. It's almost here. The pain is so frequent. The pain is increasing in intensity. It will not get better. It will only get worse. And whether you can attribute that to global warming, I am not in a position to make any dogmatic pronouncement. But the thing is, it is a fact in human history. So whenever we look at our televisions and see the devastation of tsunamis, storms, Hurricane Katrina, Yolanda, with increasing undu, with increasing frequency and intensity. We must view them as eschatological birth bands. And we have to understand that they will not become less frequent, less intense in the future years. They will only become more frequent and more intense. And then, also, finally, a third truth we must believe in interpreting these events is not only that these calamities are the result of man's alienation from the earth because of man's alienation and rebellion against God. Not only are we to remember that they are the signs that Point us to the final judgment, the destruction of the earth and the universe by fire. But thirdly, and finally, all disasters and calamities are also signs pointing to the liberation of the whole creation from its slavery to corruption. And that's the passive side of it. The final judgment of fallen humanity will also coincide with the final redemption of all those who have repented and believed in Christ. And it will be the liberation of the earth and the whole creation from the slavery of corruption. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 19. Romans 8 verse 19 For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the reveal, revealing of the sons of God. For the whole creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth 
together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption of sons, the redemption of our body. The fate of creation is bound up with that of humanity. He was created to rule over all of God's creation. And therefore, the fate of the entire creation is bound up with that of humanity. When man fell into sin, God subjected the entire creation to futility and to the slavery of corruption. Creation cannot reach its full potential. While we see growth and development, there will be destruction, devastation, disintegration, disarray, and decay. And this will definitely affect human life, human labor. However, this is just a temporary arrangement until God's purpose has reached its fulfillment. And using the language of personification, the Apostle Paul, under the infallible guidance of the Spirit, describes creation as anxiously longing for the revealing of the sons of God, those who have been redeemed by Christ. And while anxiously waiting for that time, the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth. These groanings and pains will increase in frequency and intensity. But the final contraction will bring about the liberation of the whole creation. From the bondage of slavery. The new earth. The new heavens. The old and original creation. Will give birth to the new creation. The new heavens and the new earth. Where righteousness dwells. So there is much that is beautiful on the earth. Even before that coming day. But can you imagine what it will be like when it's finally liberated from its slavery to corruption? And that is how we are to view those things. That's how we are to interpret and make sense of what is happening. That's true. I have never seen the same frequency of storms and flooding. And I'm only 50 plus years old, when I was young. I have never seen greater devastations. There is the increase of frequency and intensity. And how are we to look at that? How are we to interpret that? It's not just global warming, whether it's true or not. I'm not even sure. It may be, but definitely, it's a fact. If we are to chronicle recent events, more devastation, more natural calamity. So by way of application, for you who are outside of Christ, you who still do not trust in Christ, listen, listen. We do not know when exactly the final judgment will come. Nobody knows. The Bible says it's like the thief in the night. It will come when you least expect it will come. But the increasing frequency and intensity of these natural calamities and catastrophes are indications that the final judgment is coming even closer. We're reaching the end of human history. I don't know for how long yet. 
Like a mother can never really precisely predict because of the birth times when she will. But you know that when that has increased in frequency and intensity, you know it's coming closer. Nine months of pregnancy. But when those birth time comes, you are towards the end. And things are not going to get better. I don't know in your lifetime how many devastations you will see. Never think it will become better. It will only become worse. Therefore, I urge you to be reconciled to God. Through his son. Be right with him. Before death. Will overtake you. Or the final judgment. Will overwhelm you. Those people. Swallowed by the waves. Destroyed by the storm. They never expected. In the language of Isaiah, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord for he will abundantly pardon. God sent his son in order to provide a just basis for the forgiveness of sins. And reconciliation with him. God has sent his son in order to weave a perfect righteousness on the basis of which he can declare you righteous and accept you as righteous. And God freely offers that salvation to all who will believe. There is a time when God will no longer be near in mercy and grace. Turn to him. Turn to him. There is an obvious increase of this calamities. These are the eschatological birth times. Why will you wait? And maybe it will take 20 more years or 100 more years before the final. Why will you wait? You don't know. The only thing you know that is nearer. We're climbing closer to the end. And in the final day, remember, it's not going to be the disasters that you will be frightened the most. But in the book of Revelations, when Christ descends in judgment, People will cry that let the waves, let the mountains fall on them because it is more frightening to face him in wrath. Mm -hmm. Then be swallowed up by the waves, covered by the mountains. Be reconciled to him. And he has provided everything. Forgiveness, a just basis, perfect righteousness. Why will you live in denial? Wishing it will not happen. It will. I urge you. Because there are nights when I wake up early in the morning, grieve for you, frightened for you. There are nights when I wake up pleading with God. Spare them. And yet you think 
I'm fearless. I'm not afraid of those disasters. You should be. And I'm frightened for you. Run to him. Be alone with him. All on him. Trust in him. And you will be eternally safe. Let the mountains roar. Let the waves swallow up land. You have a refuge. Even when you die, you're safe. But to you who believe in Christ and have been reconciled to God, listen. When unbelievers are alarmed by the increasing frequency and intensity of natural catastrophes in the form of earthquakes, tsunamis, superstorms, rejoice and be glad. Because that means our final redemption is near. The Lord said in Luke 21, 28, to his disciples that when these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. You will experience completed salvation and you will see a glorious creation you have never imagined. A safe place to be in complete harmony with man. And creation will never become an instrument of human destruction. And while eagerly waiting for that day, remember to lay up treasures not on earth, but in heaven. As the Lord said, everything we have here on earth will not last. One earthquake, one tsunami, one superstorm can destroy everything. And hunger and desperate, hungry and desperate people can break in and steal everything we have. Therefore, lay up treasures, not on earth. They will all come to nothing anyway. We have treasures in heaven. Live a righteous, holy, godly life. And while still we have time, let us proclaim the truth. Tell them why. How they are to interpret this. It's our goal to open up the eyes of the blind so that they will really see. And turn from darkness to light, from the dominion of Satan and to God. And we are to spread a message of reconciliation to God for all fallen humanity. And we have to seize the opportunity while we have. Because we do not know the size of the window of our opportunity. In the language of the Lord Jesus, we must work the works of him who sent me. As long as it is still day, night is coming when no one can work. And we do this by proclaiming the truth, helping them make sense of what is happening through the light of God's scriptures, proclaiming to them the gospel of forgiveness and reconciliation. And living a godly life in order to glorify 